Back in 1959, Standard Triumph launched an all-new small car. And across the following decade, it became one of Britain's favourites. But 60 years on, the Triumph name is best remembered for its sports cars. And only a few years after the Herald was launched, Triumph took its chassis, reclothed it, and created the iconic Triumph Spitfire. But at the same time, they took the original Herald, shoved a thumping straight six under the bonnet, and created one of the first super saloons the world had ever seen. The Triumph Vitesse. When it was launched, the Herald was a bit of a game changer for Triumph. The engineering beneath was exceptionally simple, but on the surface, it was the first car of its size to have a Triumph badge, as opposed to the standards that preceded it. And to go with that more prestigious sporting name was a gorgeous body styled by Giovanni Michelotti. This combination endeared the Herald to its public, managing to play a game at appearing upright and respectable, very British, while simultaneously being incredibly chic and daring with its Italian flair, wedgy stance and big fins at the back. Standard Triumph were a relatively small company, and despite the fact that they had to be swallowed up by Leyland to avoid bankruptcy, they produced over half a million heralds. It was an enormous success, but the original car, despite the badging on the front, had next to no sporting features. But 1962 was the year that was to change. Thanks to the fact that the Herald sat on a separate chassis, it was incredibly easy for them to engineer the Spitfire, and that car was launched in the October. But five months before, in the May, the Vitesse made its debut. And though it shared the same body, as the Herald, it was treated to a Michelotti penned facelift, and this single starting point completely altered the character of the car. With some very simple alterations, Michelotti had converted the upright and respectable Herald into the menacing, edgy and sonorous Vitesse. The original car had single headlamps, and the grille was recessed into the front panel, giving it a standoffish attitude. And that's probably how it excelled at appearing conservative, considering the rest of the car's rakishness. But the Vitesse's sharply angled brows and headlamps give it a sense of viciousness, accentuated by the cutouts in the headlamp panels. Between the lamps, there's a prominent, tightly packed mesh grille that looks to me as a nod towards motorsport. And all of this sits below the sharp edge of the bonnet. Gone is the roundedness of the Herald. This car is all about sharp angles. And this style works so well with the rest of the original Herald styling. The sides of the car are tapered inwards towards the top, giving it a squat appearance that seems to slash downwards from the glass house to the sills. Above the flowing line that follows the wheel arches are a pair of diverging swages, emanating from the fins and surrounding the front three quarters of the car, the uppermost of which is chromed and highlights that lip above the front grille. An enormously steep glass house squares off the stance, with a narrowing C-pillar and the characteristic Michelotti peak above the rear screen. And inside the car, the stylishness continues. The Standard Herald was afforded the privilege of a wood-laden dashboard, but the Vitesse takes it up a notch, with wood door cappings alongside a full complement of instruments, including a tachometer. There's also a factory-fitted Britax sunroof, leather-wrapped steering wheel and sculpted seats. It's a phenomenally pretty car from any angle, and all the details, such as the Triumph script on the pillars and chrome work that feeds into the rear lamps, elevate it above anything else in its class at the time. And that point, along with the aforementioned Triumph badging, is key to understanding how both the Herald and Vitesse were perceived in period. So it's a topic we'll come back to later. But besides the front-end styling, the only obvious ways to distinguish a Vitesse from a Herald are the badges 
and these give us a little indication to the part that matters, and we'll find that under the bonnet. But because this is a separate chassis Triumph, we get a bit more than we bargained for. In order to get to the engine, we need to lift these two latches behind the front wheels, and then, just like this, all of the front suspension is unveiled, between which is the famous Triumph Straight Six. The original Herald may do with a little 948cc overhead valve four banger. And while that was adequate and par for the course for this segment, it wasn't particularly befitting for a Triumph. And while this was later expanded to 1147cc, it still only produced 39 brake horsepower. But someone at some point within Standard Triumph spotted a rather beefier engine in the works that could give the Herald a bit of a fire in its belly and a feature no car in this class could ever have dreamed of. In the early 60s, the engine that would become the iconic, sonorous power plant of the TR5 and TR6 was only being used in one car, the big and rather staid Standard Vanguard. A full year before it would become the centrepiece of the Triumph 2000 and half a decade before the TR5, this straight six found its first genuinely racy recipient. In the Vanguard, the new overhead valve 6 displaced 2000cc, but that sounded a bit much for the little Herald, so when it was launched in 62, the Vitesse's engine had a smaller bore, creating a 1600cc straight 6, producing a rather modest sounding 70 brake horsepower. That wasn't an awful lot, but bear in mind that this was before we'd seen the likes of the homologation special Mini Cooper S, and that produced about the same. In 1962 then, a six-cylinder engine in a car like this was completely unheard of, especially as it produced nearly double the power output of a standard Herald. But this didn't last for long, as in 1966, the Vitesse received its full 2000cc, and with that came the all-important badges, a 0-60 time of under 12 seconds, over 100 miles per hour flat out, and a peak power figure of 95 brake horsepower. And that puts a very small four-seater saloon right into the territory of the sports car. And not too long afterwards, the power was bumped up again to 104 brake horsepower, putting it scarily close to the much larger, more modern and more sophisticated Lotus Cortina, which also cost a third more to buy than the Vitesse. And bringing something like the Cortina into this discussion presents an interesting new dimension. As I alluded to earlier, Triumphs had a certain level of prestige attached to them, and while perception is a factor that's incredibly hard to quantify some 60 years after the fact, it's a big part of why both the Herald and Vitesse were indeed so popular. In period, two of the Herald's biggest competitors were the Ford Anglia and BMC's Mini, and in comparison, the little Triumph looked and felt like it was from a different class. But this crossover is hard to quantify. While everything else on the market was considered normal and very common, the Herald and Vitesse, despite their incredibly simple underpinnings and rather high sales figures, were always considered premium and middle class. It's the same trick that Audi and BMW play today. Common as muck, but people's perception makes them believe in a serious sense of exclusivity. And if the Herald was the 2 Series BMW of its day, then the Vitesse was the M2 of its day. Beneath its Italian styling, wood-laden interior and fire-breathing engine are those incredibly simple mechanicals. Because unlike most other cars of the 60s, the Herald and Vitesse sat upon a separate chassis, with the body essentially consisting of three separate parts that all bolt on top. That's why we have our big clamshell bonnet, for example, and the suspension that's connected to the chassis is similarly old-fashioned. 
To give it its dues, the front end is double wishbone with coil springs, plus the steering is rack and pinion, and these features give it direct, confidence-inspiring steering. Plus, these cars have an incredibly tight turning circle. Beneath the D1s this car has fitted, there are also disc brakes, so this all looks perfectly good and, dare I say, advanced for 1962. But at the back are where things become interesting, as the Herald and Vitesse were fitted with swing axles and a transverse leaf spring across them. What this means in practice is that when thrown off camber or presented with a particularly sharp throw of the steering, one of the rear wheels could very quickly gain an incredible amount of positive camber, tucking it under the car and leading to some interesting oversteer. But that's a little bit of what makes the Vitesse, with its huge engine, such a laugh. Though for the later 104 horsepower cars, Triumph did extensively modify the system, fitting it with lower wishbones and new drive shafts that limited the travel and endeared the car with much more solid road holding. But regardless of the engineering, what this really means is that the Vitesse is less of a car with a big engine and more of a big engine with a car strapped to the back of it. The Triumph Vitesse is a car that confuses me. I adore the fact that someone thought that this was a good idea, to shove a big straight six in a very small car. And I also adore the styling. It's so striking and so sharp, with just that hint of aggression that teases at what's beneath. But alongside all that is a chassis that was outdated even in 1959. The body on frame design was actually an accident. It happened because Triumph couldn't find anywhere with the capacity to build them a monocoque, and so this was the easiest route out to get the car being produced as quickly as possible. It did gain a number of improvements through its life, but it's never what you'd consider a finely tuned driver's car. But this fact didn't stop the Herald, the Vitesse, the Spitfire or the GT6 from becoming some of Britain's favourite classics. In period, its two main selling points were definitely the number of cylinders and the styling. But as a classic, the fact that it's just a very, very cool car alongside a vibrant owner's community and the fact that these are some of the easiest cars to work on of them all endeared them to thousands then and continues to 60 years later. And on that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to TwinCam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please do follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.